He reigns forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns forevermore. And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this first Sunday in June. Boy, 2018 is just flying by. And we are certainly grateful for your watching the today. We appreciate so much the comments made about the program, the cards, the letters, the uh, contributions that are still coming in for Bibles for Cuba. We're getting those Bibles distributed as quickly as we can. Uh, we do appreciate so much the fact that we are beginning our 39th year on Abundant Living. Uh, I talked to a lady uh, well, I was with the Farley Church of Christ last Sunday, and I enjoyed worshiping with them. And uh, one of the ladies commented that she had been watching me from the beginning. I said, that was back when I had black hair. She said, well, it was already turning gray. So she reminded me that it did turn early. So, But it's great to be with you. And I hope that all is well with you and your family, wherever you're watching Abundant Living. This is brought to you by the Mayfair Church. And uh, we're excited about uh, the fact that Vacation Bible School will begin next Sunday, not this Sunday, the 3rd, but the, uh, the 10th. And then we really start on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. You can go online and you can register for this Vacation Bible School for your children. You know, it, this, is, this has been going on at, as long as I can remember. And a lot of churches have dropped out and they don't do it anymore. But I don't know of anything at Mayfair that more effort is put into it than this Vacation Bible School. Begins at 9, it's over 12, and then they have their kind of their uh, graduation on Wednesday night, and that's always a wonderful uh, occasion. So Vacation Bible School, and we'll, certainly you will enjoy the shipwreck rescued by Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful title? And I'm, I hope you will, if you can, go online and uh, register your children for this Vacation Bible School. That begins next Sunday and goes through Wednesday. I do appreciate the interest that you show in Abundant Living. Uh, you give me the opportunity to come into your home on a daily basis, on a, well, on a weekly basis, rather, every Sunday morning, and that's always a blessing. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13, because we're going to continue what I started last Sunday, talking about the Lord's vision for the church. You know, I've, I've told you for quite a while now, I have been not preaching at Mayfair. Jason Bybee is doing an excellent job doing that, and I'm on the road. I'm trying to encourage and help churches grow. And so I, I have to be careful that I go back and remind myself of what the Lord wants the church to do, not what Gary Bradley wants the church to do. Uh, church growth can be a misleading thing. It can only, in the minds of some people, it can just be about numbers. It's not about just numbers. It's about people. In fact, when I begin this series, I talk about do you, uh, you will find that in the Lord's vision for the church, it's people that count. You don't just count people. And there's a big difference. So let's keep that in mind. But uh, remember our World Bible School, too, uh, that's an opportunity for me to communicate with you on our Bible study. And so many people, next Sunday now, we're going to talk about how to study the Bible. The title is, uh, Do You Understand What You're Reading? And a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, do not. So please uh, make note of that and be sure and be with us next week. 
But we're talking today about the Lord's vision for the church. And you'd think when I talk about the church, we would go to Acts chapter 2, where the church had its beginning. And that, of course, is a very good place. But there was preparation for the church, or kingdom. The words are used interchangeably. I know the word kingdom means place where God reigns. And, of course, He does reign in the church because uh, His Son, Christ, is the head of the church, and He gave Himself up for it, Ephesians 5. So when we think about Christ's vision for the church, uh, sometimes the word church kind of leaves a, a, a turnoff for a lot of people because they went. Maybe they were not welcomed. Maybe they were offended in some way. Maybe they felt like the people acted like they were a little better than anybody else, which is far from the truth. So we have to kind of clarify. That's what I like about Abundant Living. I can come on the air with you, and we can sit with our Bible between us, and we can talk about what the Bible says, not what Gary says, not what you say. It's, uh, it's a fact that it's, let's get back to the Word of God. Let's get back to how the Lord set it up. Uh, I love these restoration shows on TV. I love to see a, a 36 Ford that has just rusted down to the frame, and they take that 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 frame and and start working on it and make it into a beautiful running automobile, or a '57 Chevrolet, which is my favorite. Uh, that was the year I graduated from high school, so that's. That's a, I've always wanted a 57 Chevrolet, but they're so expensive now, you'll never have one unless you've got a lot of money. But anyway, I love to see things restored, and that's what we're all about. We're all about restoring, let's bring back to the original condition, the church. And uh, for a lot of people, that, that sounds like what we need to do. For other people, they're not interested just like they weren't interested in the Lord's idea. Notice that Rome had overtaken, they'd been in charge now of the Christians, and they had, see, Rome did not destroy religions. Rome tolerated religions and taxed religions, and they got more money. The Romans got more money out of the Jerusalem group of Jewish people than any place else. So that's the reason they kind of, during the crucifixion, they sent the centurion down. They didn't want, and, and, and one of the charges was, if you don't crucify Jesus, you won't be a friend of Caesar's. Oh boy, you really want to be a friend of his, you know, because he's in charge of the world at that time. And so when we think about the matter of the fact Jesus came, and he, he began talking about a kingdom. He said, my kingdom, in John 17, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, then would my, then would my soldiers fight. Then would my members fight. That's when he told Peter to put up his sword. We didn't come here for a fight. We're not about an earthly kingdom. We don't have an earthly headquarters. Our headquarters is in heaven uh, where Christ reigns eternally. And so when we think about what the Lord said about the church, it's not in Acts 2. In fact, it's not in the book of Ephesians. It's all about the church. It's one of the greatest six chapters, and it's one of the greatest books in the Bible about the church. Uh, the church in the New Testament, not in the 21st century, because sometimes today it's difficult to recognize uh, you know, the church. You can use the name, you can go through the motions, but do you do it like John 4? God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship in spirit, that's the right attitude, and in truth. In other words, the Lord's told us how to do that. And that's the reason when you come to a Church of Christ, you'll find we sing without an instrument. We sing from the heart. We do have an instrument, and it's the heart. It's the DNA of, of man. And when we sing... Um, uh, when we all get to heaven, when we sing Trust and Obey like we did last Sunday for the invitation song at Farley, uh, it reminds me of how important it is that we trust the Lord, like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will abundantly pardon. So when we trust the Lord and we obey Him, then that's what life is really all about. 
Paul says, for me to live is Christ. For me to live. For some people to live, it's fun, entertainment, work, family. And that's some, these are good. These have their places. But it shouldn't be my main purpose in life. Because my main purpose in life, according to Ephesians 3.20, is to glorify the Lord in the church when he closed out that beautiful first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. So we're talking about the Lord and his church. And a odd place to go, <clears throat> excuse me, is the book of Luke chapter 13 when he starts telling stories. He says, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, that's the church on earth that will be someday completely uh, gathering, gather, gathering together in heaven. When he said, upon, he said in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build my church. That's the ecclesia. That's the called out. And then he says, I'll give unto you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. Because who preached on Pentecost? Peter did. <clears throat> who preached the first gospel sermon? Who preached that the gospel is for everybody? Peter, after he learned a hard lesson uh, when he was called to the household or, of Cornelius. So it's, it's very interesting that we look in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is four stories about Jesus. Now, Luke is a Gentile. Luke tells us some things that Matthew doesn't tell because he was writing to Jews. Mark doesn't tell. John doesn't tell. Half of the book of John is the last seven days of the life of Jesus. John doesn't even begin with the birth of Christ. Matthew and Luke begin with the birth of Christ. And so if you read Mark, he's already in his ministry. You read John, he's already in his ministry. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So let's look at what he says. Let's begin in verse 22. Well, really, no, let's start down. We talked about it last time, but... Uh, Let's begin in verse 18 of Luke chapter 13. Then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? That would be like me asking you, what's the church like? Well, it's a lot of entertainment. It's, uh, it's a, a lot of political emphasis. Well, what is the church like today? Uh, I don't think I've ever seen as many churches with as many different names as I see today. And, uh, it, you know, they're, they're, they're let's, let's get back to what, what was the church called in the New Testament day. It was called the Church of God, the Church of Christ, the Church of the Firstborn, the Church of the New Testament. Uh, you know, all those are, are biblical names that identify what the church is all about. Uh, I saw one some time ago, the Church of the Brethren. Well, it may be that the brethren, you know, worship there, but the church doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. Like in 1 Corinthians 1, when Paul was talking about division, and he said, y'all are following Peter and Paul and Chloe and uh, Chloe tells me that y'all are following all these men. He said, did Christ die for you? Well, Yes. Uh, did Paul die for you? Well, no. Were you, uh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, no. Well, what if you were? Then you'd belong to Paul. So he, he knocks out division in, in the first chapter by telling them it's totally unscriptural. And it's unacceptable. He said, is Christ divided? Have you all divided the body of Christ? You certainly have because you, are, you have preacheritis. You're following this man and you're following that man and you're following that man and you're not following Christ. So then, what is the kingdom of God like? Uh, what shall I compare it to? Now, now, remember what I said about parables. Parables are an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I learned that when I was in vacation Bible school. Okay, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's got a heavenly application. <clears throat> One, the reason he taught in parables was because it was easy to remember, but there was always troublemakers in the crowd. There was always the enemy of Christ present when Christ 
began to teach. And they would go back and tell the authorities what he was talking about. Is this troublemaker? Is this uh, blasphemer he was accused of? Is this troublemaker from Nazareth going to overthrow the government? Is that what he's talking about when he talks about a new kingdom? In fact, even the apostles had a problem with this in Romans and in, in Acts chapter 1. He said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel to its place? Are you going to go back and make God's people your only chosen people plus proselytes? And he, he said, you don't get the point. You don't understand. The gospel is for everybody. And that was a hard pill for them to swallow. The fact that the gospel was for the Gentiles too. And they consider Gentiles as dogs. They consider Gentiles as pagans. And read about it in Acts chapter 10 when Cornelius, first Gentile convert that we know of, and uh, the lesson that Peter had to learn that what the Lord has cleansed, don't you call common. And that's what they called. <laughs> that was a, a good name compared to some of them. So here we find the kingdom of heaven what is it compared to? It is like a mustard seed. Now, last time we talked about it, you know, mustard seed is that little bitty seed on the end of your finger. If you were to drop it, you'd have a hard time finding it. But he said, it's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. Now, they had done that. Some of them there probably had mustard seed plants or trees. Now, it grew. I want the kingdom of God to grow. It grew and became a tree, a little bitty seed. We see that in oak trees and other kinds of trees that the seed falls wherever it is. I've <coughs> cut up some, I've dug up in the past some, some bushes and, and shrubbery that I didn't want and I didn't get it all. And first thing you know, next year, here it comes up out of the ground again. So then he has the mustard seed sown. It grew, became a tree, and the birds of all, uh, the birds of the air perched in its branches. And again he said, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? In other words, that's one lesson. Number two, it's like yeast. A woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through its dough. So he said, I want the kingdom of God to grow. I want it to grow. I want it to start growing. And I'm comparing it to something you can take home with you. I didn't finish that last point a while ago about the enemy of God. And so when, when Jesus talked about, oh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Oh, well, he, he, they go back to their authorities and they say, oh, this, this teacher is just talking, uh, this rabbi is just talking about seeds and, and mustard seeds and yeast and things. He's not talking about getting an army together and overthrowing the, the uh, Roman government. So don't worry about it. But what point is Jesus making? Why did he go to this trouble to say the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed? It's like something that's planted and it grows into a a beautiful, beautiful branch and tr of trees, and uh, trees with branches and birds rest in its branches. Or it's like a woman that takes yeast. You remember last time I told you about uh, me trying to make uh, grits, and and I had the water and I poured in all the box of grits, and grits was just going everywhere. Well, that's that's kind of what uh, yeast does. Doesn't take but just a little bit. But then it infiltrates, it saturates itself with the entire dough. The kingdom of heaven started with one person, and it was a baby lying in a manger. When he was 12 years old, he said, uh, Know ye not that I should be about my father's business? Well, what, what was that? Carpenter work? Was he talking about Joseph? No. He wasn't talking about Joseph. He did work, obviously, as a carpenter with Joseph. Joseph must have died very early in the life of Jesus because he's not spoken of anywhere else after this uh, occasion in Luke chapter tw uh, in uh, the book of Luke chapter two, when he was twelve years old. And so he said, "My kingdom is not of this world," as I said earlier. As he told his apostles, we're not here to fight. Peter, put up your sword. That's not the king. I want the gospel. 
I want the saving gospel of Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Read the, read the Beatitudes. Uh, read the Sermon on the Mount if you want to get ready to be a Christian. If you want to know what a Christian is and how a Christian is to live and how a Christian is to behave, read the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that, here it is, hunger and thirst after righteousness. You just got an appetite for things that are good. You just, you just want to do what's right. And that, that's a wonderful quality because the Bible says <clears throat> that Jesus went about doing good. He went about doing as a father would instruct and so he said, the kingdom of heaven is to grow. And then a very interesting question comes up. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching. As he went on his way to Jerusalem, someone asked him, Lord, that means master, uh, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Wow, boy, that's a delicate question when you talk about people being saved and being lost. I'm glad that's not my job. I'm glad the Lord answered that a long time ago uh, when he said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Now, that's what we ought to be about. And uh, we should try to do all of the will of God. Like in Acts chapter 10, when uh, Peter got to the household of Cornelius, uh, I love this passage. I think I preached on it a few weeks ago out at uh, Owens Crossroads uh, when it says, we're all here together. Isn't that wonderful? Can, you get, <laughs> can we get the church together? And that's difficult to do, uh, especially with our m mobile society that we live in. Uh, and he got, the, and we're all here together to hear what the Lord has commanded you to say. That's what church is about. It's not about who's there and who's not. It's not about uh, somewhere to go on Sunday morning. It's not uh, a family reunion in the sense that the Lord, what my definition of worship is to be preoccupied with God. And the reason worship used to mean more to us than it does is because we used to get ready for worship, like on Saturday. Now, I don't mean we just read our Bibles and prayed all Saturday, but we, we just kind of look forward. Like in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, Forsake not the assembling yourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhort one another insomuch the more as you see the day approaching. I think that's the Lord's day. And that's what we ought to do during the week. I'll see you Sunday. You remember that? I'll see you Sunday. So we used to get ready for Sunday. We used to get ready for worship. And so then he says, are a few going to be saved? Well, where are the saved? Are they still in the world? Of course not. Why did he save them and leave them in the world? When he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, 1 John 2, 15. So when the Lord saves you, what does he do? He adds you to the church. Which church? The one that is following his will. I talked to a man years ago in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he had joined a particular religious group. And I asked him about the word, the preaching and the word. He said, no, he said, all they talk about is love. And I'm afraid they're going to love me right into torment. Now, love needs to be looked at as the scriptures look at. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's not a Hollywood, chilly, uh, emotional uh, high. It's a verb. It's action. Paul says love in 1 Corinthians 13 is patient and kind and uh, forgiving. And it doesn't take account of evil. It's generous. He said, if I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profited me nothing. If I, if I take all my riches and feed the poor, boy, wouldn't that be on the headlines? He said, but if I don't do it for love, it profits me nothing. And the interesting word, the Greek word for nothing there means zero. It means absolutely nothing. 
And so then he said, who are going to be saved? Well, the Lord will determine that when he saves the people that obey him, Acts 2.47. And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. Well, what had they done? Exactly what Peter told them to. When they cried out, men and brethren, what should we do? Peter said, repent. Repent of what? Repent of everything you're doing that's wrong. In other words, like Marshall Keeble says, just quit it. Whatever you're doing that's wrong, stop it. And if you don't stop it, then you haven't repented. It doesn't mean you got caught. It means you've done wrong. And 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is a transgression of the law. It's stepping across the line. And we know when we step across the line, if we've been taught the Word of God. And so he says here that who's going to be saved? I know. Matthew 7, 21 tells me. In Luke 6, 46, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? I'd like to ask that all over town, all over the Tennessee Valley. You know, why do you, why do you acknowledge the fact that there is a Lord and that we are made in His image, and He did die on a rugged cross in Jerusalem. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? The word Lord, Lord there means Master, Master. Can you imagine a slave saying, Master, Master, and then totally ignoring what He told him to do? And so then that is an interesting point. I want you to look at verse 28 before our time runs out this morning. He says, uh, uh, when he, he says, people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. That means that the vision the Lord has for the church is that everybody is welcome. What did he mean they will come from the north and the south and the east and the north? That means it doesn't matter who you are what color your skin, what color, what kind of background you have, rich or poor, great or small, it doesn't matter. The kingdom of God is for everybody. Somebody told me a long time ago when I began to preach that the ground is level at the cross, that anybody can be saved. And I'm so reminded of this when I go to Cuba, and, and I see people that have been under communism for over 50-something years, still under it, and yet the gospel is for them. The gospel is to make poor people rich. Make poor people rich. Some of the poorest people I know, like we go to the Baja, we go to Honduras, we go to these places that just hardly have enough to exist, but yet they can be rich in Christ because they can have their sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb because they were baptized into Christ and the Lord saved them. Well, our time is gone for this morning. Thank you for watching. Now, remember, next Sunday, we're going to talk about why we don't understand the Bible alike. Why is one preacher saying one thing and another preacher saying something else? I hope you'll be with us. Until next week, may God bless you is our prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ, a place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ. We're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty Who was and is and is to come Blessed be the Lord